Australia was vital to Allied efforts in the Pacific during the Second World War. And while there never seems to have been a Japanese plan to invade Australia, there was definitely an effort to isolate Australia so as to deny it as a base of operation to the Allies. And the efforts to isolate Australia were never as aggressive as the better known Battle of the Atlantic, but nonetheless it was an important and little remembered theater in the war, where mariners risked their lives every day in order to keep open vital, very long lanes of supply and communication. In one little-known battle between an Allied tanker and its escort against two heavily armed Japanese cruisers, well represents the heroism and sacrifice of those, many of them civilian mariners, who fought the Second World War in the Indian Ocean. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The Aikaku Moru and the Hokaku Moru were both built for the Osaka shipping line as cargo liners, ships designed to carry both passengers and cargo for regular routes between Japan and South America. They're designed as luxury liners to include a suite of luxury rooms, with a displacement of around 10,000 tons, a length of 160.8 meters, or 527 feet 7 inches, and a beam of 20.2 meters, or 66 feet 3 inches. The ships were capable of speeds in excess of 20 knots. Both ships entered service in 1940. Both ships have been built using Japanese government subsidies that were designed to encourage the building of merchant ships that could, in the future, be converted for military use as fast troop transports. The ships had hard points designed to anchor naval artillery and included provisions for the placement of landing craft. Neither ship was given the opportunity to travel to South America as originally planned. Both were requisitioned into the Imperial Japanese Navy in August 1941 and were converted for use as commerce raiders. Commerce raiders were usually armed as heavily as a cruiser, but built on merchant hulls. They weren't designed to take on other warships, but rather to disrupt shipping by attacking merchant vessels. The reason for the use of merchant hulls is that not only allowed a nation to expand its fleet relatively cheaply, but disguised as a merchant vessel, the commerce raider could get much closer to another vessel before attacking it. They are distinct from armed merchant vessels, which were much more lightly armed and intended still to be used as merchant vessels, but would have one or more guns attached in order to defend themselves from submarines or air attack. Commerce raiders were sufficiently armed to handle armed merchant vessels, but it was still dangerous work, as they were usually outclassed by armored warships. If a merchant raider was operating in an area, the local naval and air forces would constantly be searching for them, and most ended their careers at the bottom of the sea. Germany made extensive use of commerce raiders, or auxiliary cruisers, in both world wars. In fact, German commerce raiders operated in the Indian Ocean and Australian waters between 1939 and 1941, before Japan's entrance into the war. The cruiser's goal was to disrupt trade and communications within the British Empire, and commerce raiders sunk a number of merchant vessels in Australian waters and the Indian Ocean by attacking or by laying mines, although the intensity of the attacks on merchant shipping was not nearly that of the North Atlantic. Notably, the German auxiliary cruiser Cormoran sank the Australian light cruiser Sydney in November 1941, although the Cormoran was also sunk in the fight. With Japan's entry into the war in December of 1941, the German commerce raiders were mostly relocated into the Atlantic or the Mediterranean. Japan did not have nearly as extensive a history with commerce raiding as Germany. In fact, Japan did not have the same strategic vision regarding merchant shipping. Rather, the Japanese Navy was designed for fleet engagements. Even the substantial Japanese submarine fleet was more often used to supply garrisons across the Japanese Pacific holdings than for attacking merchant shipping. Although there was never a Japanese plan to invade Australia, the Imperial Japanese Navy did try to isolate Australia to prevent it being used as a staging area for Allied operations. Japanese submarines laid mines and conducted attacks in Australian waters, but again not with the same intensity with which German raiders and U-boats tried to cut off supply to Britain. The Aikaku Maru and the Hokaku Maru were one of a handful of Japanese merchant vessels converted as commerce raiders. The decision was likely driven by demands from their German allies, who were eager to cut off British supply routes from the Middle East. The ships were well armed, originally mounting four six-inch guns, as well as torpedo tubes and heavy anti-aircraft guns. Their armament was equal to or superior to Japanese light cruisers of the period. In addition, the ships had launches and cranes for float planes. Given their speed, nearly twice most merchant vessels of the time, and the long-range detection abilities of the float planes, the ships could cover large swaths of ocean. The Japanese design and philosophy for their commerce raiders was different than the Germans. In general, there was little attempt to disguise either ship as a merchant vessel, and the guns were readily visible on deck. The Japanese also had their surface raiders operate in pairs. The Aikaku Moru and the Hokaku Moru were sent out together in November of 1941 prepared to engage in commerce raiding at the outset of the war after the planned attack on Pearl Harbor. 
From December 1941 through February 1942, they found moderate success, sinking two Allied merchant vessels before returning to Japan. In February, their armament was upgraded. The four World War I era 6-inch guns were upgraded to eight newer 5.5-inch guns, and equipment was added to allow two float planes rather than one. The ships were also modified to allow storage of submarine torpedoes, thus allowing them to operate as submarine tenders as well as raiders. The pair supplied submarine operations off the coast of Africa, where submarines they helped to supply sunk over 100,000 tons of Allied shipping. The two then returned to commerce raiding and sunk or captured three more Allied merchant vessels in May and June 1942. They were used as troop transports during the Guadalcanal campaign, but by November of 1942 they were back in the Indian Ocean operating as commerce raiders. There they ran into the Dutch oil tanker MV Ondina. The Ondina was an oil tanker built in 1939 for Royal Dutch Shell. The 130.49 meter or 428 foot long tanker had a displacement of some 9,000 tons and a top speed of 12 knots. She was armed, but only with a single World War I era 4 inch quick firing gun and machine guns for air defense. Part of the important line of supply between Australia and the Middle East, the modern vessel was traveling from Fremantle, Australia to Abadan, Iran to pick up fuel oil, a trip of more than 6,000 miles. The Undina was accompanied by the Corvette Bengal, a ship of the Royal Indian Navy. The HMIS Bengal was a Bathurst class Corvette. The Bathurst class were general purpose craft, classified as minesweepers, but also designed for convoy escort and anti-submarine roles. The Bengal was temporarily assigned to the Indian Navy, but its crew was Australian. The ships were designed to mount a 4-inch gun, but those were in short supply, and many, including the Bengal, were instead outfitted with the venerable 12-pounder, a 76mm gun. While the Bengal was equipped with depth charges in case of submarine contacts, its 76mm gun was actually inferior to the deck guns carried on most Axis submarines, and the small 57-meter, just 186-foot vessel would have been hard-pressed to defend the Ondina from submarine attack. In fact, the Ondina had a bigger gun than its escort. On November 11th at 11.45 in the morning, a lookout aboard the Ondina sighted an unidentified ship some seven and a half miles away, followed by a similar vessel. As no Allied ships were reported in the area, they assumed the ships were Japanese. They were, of course, the Aikaku and the Hokaku. The Undina and Bengal turned away from the ships, and Bengal radioed an SOS to naval authorities in Fremantle. The ships were massively outgunned by the two commerce raiders. Each of the Japanese vessels carried eight guns of larger caliber and range than the two heavy guns on the Undina and Bengal combined. Bravely, the corvette, under the command of Lieutenant Commander R.J. Wilson, turned towards the cruisers, ordering the Undina to make a run for it. The Bengal's only hope was to close quickly to bring her 76mm gun into range. Although she could not hope to win the fight, she hoped to score some hits and perhaps delay the raiders long enough for Undina to make her escape. Bengal's gun opened fire around noon. And so did the Ondina. Although Lieutenant Commander Wilson had ordered the Ondina to make a run for it, the Ondina's captain, W. Horseman, had decided that that was pointless because the Japanese ships were nearly twice as fast as the Ondina. Shots from the heavy guns of the cruisers straddled the Ondina and blew off her main mast. The Ondina answered, a shot from her 4-inch gun striking the superstructure of the Hokaku, but doing no apparent significant damage. More shells were hitting the Ondina, but moments later an explosion was seen aboard the Hokaku. A lucky shot had struck the starboard torpedo mount, causing the torpedo to explode and setting the ship on fire. The ship was already listing heavily and settling to the stern as it emerged from the smoke of the explosion. While the Hokaku Maru was heavily armed, it was still built as a merchant ship. It was unarmored and did not have enough watertight bulkheads. The explosion had blown off the stern of the ship and thrown off the two float planes. The fires reached the engine room, and the ship lost electricity and propulsion. With no hope of saving the ship, Captain Imazato Hiroshi ordered abandoned ship. Despite being heavily outgunned, the Ondina and Bengal had destroyed the larger vessel, but the Aikaku was still firing and was still better gunned than the tanker and corvette. What's more, the Bengal had a limited amount of ammunition, and she was running out. By 1245, Bengal was out of ammunition for her 76mm gun, and Lieutenant Commander Wilson knew he could no longer do anything to help the Ondina. The Akaku had scored a hit on the Bengal's forecastle, but the damage was not crippling. Bengal made smoke and retreated, taking another hit from one of Akaku's 5.5-inch guns on her stern. As Bengal retreated, they could see shells striking the Ondina. They set course for Diego Garcia, reporting to authorities that one raider and the Ondina had been sunk. The Ondina was also running out of shells, but still steaming full speed ahead. 
As she fired her last shell, Captain Horseman ordered the ship brought to a stop and the crew to abandon ship under a white flag, hoping to prevent further loss of life. The Aikaku continued firing, and Captain Horseman was killed by shrapnel when a shell hit the bridge. Aikaku came in close to the freighter, which was listing 35 degrees, and fired two torpedoes at the bow to finish her off. Then Aikaku's gun crews fired their machine guns at the lifeboats, killing a sailor and wounding three others, before turning to rescue the survivors of the Hokaku. After retrieving survivors from the Hokaku, the Aikaku fired another torpedo at the still-floating Ondina, and, assuming that the ship was doomed, sailed away. There was an argument among the survivors in the lifeboats. The Ondina's first officer wanted to reboard the vessel, but most of the crew assumed that the ship was sinking. Still, he managed to convince enough crew to join him to reboard the ship. Despite receiving multiple hits, the ship was still well afloat. Tankers were built with multiple watertight compartments, and the ones that had not been breached were enough to keep the Ondina seaworthy. The engine room was undamaged, and counter-flooding was able to write the list. Almost miraculously, the Undina had survived the attack. But the Undina still had to make it to safety, and she had severely injured crew. Moreover, as was policy, the code books had been thrown overboard when the captain made the order to abandon ship. Undina was forced to radio a call for help, uncoded. Authorities, having been informed that the Undina had been sunk, assumed the message was a Japanese trick. When authorities at Fremantle asked the Ondina for its location, the crew of the Ondina suspected a Japanese trick and didn't respond. The Ondina was finally spotted by an Australian Catalina flying boat some 200 miles from Fremantle. The Ondina had sighted another vessel and asked the flying boat if the other vessel could assist with the wounded. As luck would have it, the boat was the hospital ship AHS Wanganella. The injured were transferred to the Wanganella just in time to save the most seriously injured. The MV Ondina arrived in Fremantle one day after the Bengal had arrived in Diego Garcia. The Ondina received official commendation and Captain Horseman was posthumously knighted by Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands. Lieutenant Commander Wilson of the Bengal received the Distinguished Service Order and several other sailors in the fight received various awards from the British and Dutch governments. Originally credit for the shot that was the killing blow for the Hokaku was given to the Bengal, but the crew of the Ondina, as well as the Japanese in the battle, were convinced that the killing blow had come from the Ondina. The Ondina was given temporary repairs and served as a static tanker for a while, but in 1943 was sent to the United States for full repairs. After the war, it served as a tanker for Royal Dutch Shell, clear until 1959. The Bengal remained with the Indian Navy and served until 1960. The Aikaku Moru rescued 278 survivors of the Hokaku and, after the battle, served as a troop transport. In February 1944, Aikaku was at Truk Island when the island came under attack during Operation Hailstorm, a massive assault by U.S. carrier-based aircraft. Struck several times, a torpedo struck ammunition in her hold. The explosion was so massive that the crew of the torpedo bomber that struck her was killed in the blast. The wreckage of the Aikaku Maru is now a popular diving location. The engagement that pitted the MV Ondina and the HMIS Bengal against the Aikaku Maru and the Hokaku Maru was interesting for a number of reasons. It involved the Dutch, whose contributions in the Pacific are underappreciated, and it was a rare role for the Royal Indian Navy. It is extraordinary that both of those vessels survived, given how heavily outgunned they were by the Japanese raiders. It represented one of the very rare encounters with Japanese surface raiders, and as it turned out, the last such encounter as the Japanese gave up the practice of surface raiding after the sinking of the Hokaku Maru. It well illustrates one of the many thousands of small engagements that occurred on the world's oceans during a war that spanned the globe. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long, and if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section and I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.